This is WCM's Park Update, a weekly show covering the outdoor hospitality industry hosted by Ben Quiggle and Mike Gast. During each episode, you'll hear from special guests and campground experts on topics that will help your park flourish. WCM's Park Update is a production of Woodall's Campground Magazine. Hi, I'm Ben Quiggle, editor of Woodall's Campground Magazine. And of course, my esteemed colleague, Mike Gast, former vice president of communications at Campgrounds of America. He runs his own marketing firm, Imola Group, which is, uh, and he's based out of Nebraska, which is warming yes. up. So hopefully it's warming up. Um, it's not Hawaii, but it's getting there. So, <laughs> but uh, um, our guests today are Jeremy and Stephanie Puglisi. And they are the co-hosts of the RV Atlas podcast, which is a very popular um, RVing podcast. Um, we're excited to have them on the show. They're also authors of See You at the Campground and Where Should We Camp Next? And they have three other books. I, I, well, two other books, and I think they're working on their fifth one. I don't know the title of the two other ones, but I know Where Should We Camp Next, I believe, was a, is doing really well on Amazon. I think all of your books are doing well on Amazon, right? Yeah, yeah, the worst we camp very next. Very lucky. Yeah, the the worst we camp next book has been uh, the number one family travel guide on Amazon for about two years. So it's yeah, it's doing great. Yeah, so that's great. And you guys just came back from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, uh, which is a great place to be this time of year. Um, how did that trip go for you guys? It went lovely as it always does. Uh, this time of year is not very um, nice weather-wise in our home state of New Jersey. We get that cold, rainy, like 50-degree windy weather along the shore here. So Myrtle Beach is one of our favorite family traditions. We escape out of here and go find some surf and sand and sun down there. Um, and there's always a battle um, internally in our family for what campground we're going to stay at because there's so many options down there and the kids have their favorites and the adults have our favorites. So we uh, pick different ones every year. <laughs> so Stephanie, what's, what's the status of the kids now? When I first met you, they were pretty small, but they've got to be, they got to be almost out of the house by now. Well, not quite. Uh, they're here. <laughs> they're here in the house and they're taking up a lot of space. Yeah, they've grown up quite a bit. So we have two teenagers now, 13 year olds, about to be 14 in a couple weeks. And then we uh, just had one celebrate his first double digits birthday at 10. So yeah. as you can imagine, um, we did start camping with them when they were babies, infants. And you can think, you know, how much it's changed, what we look for in a campground and how our camping trips have changed. I mean, we're very cliched that way, right? Now that our kids are 10 and 14 almost, they want all the activities for the bigger kids. They don't care about, you know, tie dyeing t-shirts anymore, right? They want the water slides and they want the wiffle ball tournaments. Um, yeah. And they also want kids there. They want their friends. Camping with friends is a huge thing that you hear about, but you don't realize how important it is until you get those teenagers, right? Who want to bring along their friends. So it's been fun as a family just to go through those different stages like, you know, most RVers and campers do. So what are you, what are you using for an RV now? I'm sitting in our Grand Design Imagine 2800 BH, which we bought two months ago, and the Myrtle Beach trip was the the very first trip. Um, and I didn't take my own advice and do a little shakedown trip first because we've been so busy. I always tell everybody go somewhere close to home, work out all the kinks, and go. But um, the Grand the Grand Design performed really really well, and it was very comfortable. Um, I'm giving it an A minus right now. There are a couple little quirky things, but in the grand scheme of things, we were we were all really the kids gave it a good review. We were all super happy with it. I think I think that's something that we've been hearing in the industry. Obviously, when you work in the camping and RVing industry, you hear a lot about uh, quality issues. I guess um, it sounds like your unit's doing pretty well so far. Is that something you guys hear when you're out on the road? People complaining about their RVs, I guess incessantly. So uh, that is a major topic of conversation among RV owners. And it's not just, uh, oh, we're having this problem or that problem. It's the the lead time. It's the amount of time for dealers to fix things that is really the profound problem. Yeah. So I was just speaking to somebody last night who picked up their dealer after five, picked up their RV after five months. And that might 
you know, shock some people, but it didn't shock me. Uh, so that's that's certainly an issue, you know, getting appointments at, at the dealership. You know, people are calling their dealership saying, hey, I need this, that or the other thing fixed. And the dealers are saying, well, we, we can take you in two months or something like that. So a, a major point of of conversation. And then, of course, that leads to everybody, you know, talking about if they're having problems or they're not having problems with their own RVs. Yeah, I know um, Rick Kessler, who you may know. Um, Mm -hmm. he bought a grand design unit last year. I know he's loved his unit and it sounds like your grand design unit's going to be a great unit too. Um, uh, I know it's just been a huge topic of conversation as the RV industry has been cranking out a lot of units. So, um, I know they're working to try to fix the issue, but it's, it's a lot, it's been a long-term issue. That's going to be, uh, take a little while to solve. It looks like. So, I think one thing I'm happy to see is that a lot of manufacturers are taking responsibility for speaking directly yeah. to their customer, right? So that was something that's changed a lot in the industry before. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to speak to the customer, right? It's like, go to your dealer. I'm seeing some manufacturers say, hey, you know what? We're going to support you to help you fix some of these easy, easily fixable things that people without the basic RV education get stuck on. And we're going to get you back out on the road and back out at the campground more quickly. Um, I think we need to have a little more work on that. I'd love to have manufacturers be able to like deploy, you know, quick service to people around the country. There's a lot of things that they can do. It's obviously a big lift um, just as, you know, from an infrastructure basis. But I think if they want people to enjoy these rigs (laughs) that are selling like hotcakes, um, they're going to have to find a way to solve that problem. And I see some movement there. So that's a good sign. So has that been exacerbated by the fact that there's so many new new RVers out there that just don't have the experience with their rigs? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, um, we, we don't even, we're not even a generation that has really developed a lot of like home maintenance, right. Um, knowledge and everything that's not either like a criticism or anything. It's just life right now. Um, and, So, you know, manufacturers, they want those sales numbers, right? And they want people to be continually shopping for new RVs and buying RVs. Um, That means they're going to have people that don't have that basic understanding of troubleshooting simple things like my refrigerator isn't turning on when I'm at the campground. Well, you know, people that have been RVing for a couple of decades will go, oh, turn on your oven, light your pilot, you know, to draw the, like, it's like these little things that no one would ever know unless some, you know, wizened old RVer told them at the campground one time. Um, and so, you know, I just think manufacturers, if they want to keep those sales numbers up, if they want to keep people feeling like this is something they can do, they're going to have to make people feel empowered for those little fixes and not wind up, you know, with their RV sitting at the dealership for five months over little things. And you had all these new RV owners, you know, coming into the industry and they were used to other types of vacations, whether it was cruises or hotel rooms or whatever, where if, you know, if the furnace doesn't come on, you, you call somebody from the hotel, from the front desk and they come fix it. Right. And that's obviously never been the ethos of, of RV ownership. (laughs) Um, So I think a lot of, a lot of the new owners are, are surprised, right? That you get this thing and it's not like a car where we've come to just rely on our cars, like our cars work, right? Um, so I think it was it was surprising and then it becomes an issue of of retaining those owners, right? Like we want them to continue to want to be RV owners. So so it is a you know existential question, really. Yeah, and I think to some degree, too, um, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there on repairs and different things, but, you know, not everyone wants to do that, and no, not everyone wants to work on their RVs either, <laughs> and so that's kind of where the repair cycle times, you know, need to come down a little bit, too. Um, I'm pretty handy with things. I don't know about Mike. Mike, are you pretty handy with things? Oh, I've I've done it my whole life. Yep. So I can build but, your house for you. <laughs> well, I'll let you know if I need a house built, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, and I guess switching gears on the camping side, we hear a lot about overcrowding. And I mean, that's something that comes up all the time. I know um, even when I read the RV travel blogs, it's just something that comes up all the time. I guess, is that something you guys notice when you guys are booking travel? Is it harder to book travel to certain areas? Um, do you hear that from other RVers? So we have a little bit of a controversial take on this, I think, right? Because yeah. It's kind of a yes and no. So yes, there is um, real overcrowding, but it's only in a very, um, like, it's only in subsections, right, of the camping niche. So 
definitely in our public lands, there's a real overcrowding um, aspect of camping, right? Um, a lot of this, though, has to do with people having started to game a very, a, a very um, creaky old reservation system, right? There's all of these things um, with the reservation system for our public lands that include um, very confusing booking windows, um, very crowded times of the year that then people start to like pad their reservations early on to get ahead of a, of a window. They don't plan on actually using that whole reservation, but it's cheaper to keep it than to cancel it because you don't get your money back. So then people wind up showing up at a state park and looking around and saying, I don't understand there's empty spaces all over the place, right? And yet I couldn't get a camping reservation here. Uh, we have subsidized pricing that really keeps it very low in the state parks, which we love. We love the fact that everybody can camp in the state parks for an affordable price. But unfortunately, that leads to people booking for, for times that they might not even be able to get there for, you know? So you have this, you have a unique issue that hasn't kind of been um, solved in a market kind of way, I think, like in some of the private campgrounds. We had someone, role, go ahead, Mike. Uh, I was just going to ask, how big a role does the inventory of RV sites play into that? Uh, you hear a lot about the, the fact that the inventory was overwhelmed by this wave uh, is that really the case? Is there, uh, is it, uh, is it just too many RVers or, or not enough sites? Which, which one do you, which uh, one is going to fix first? I really think that a lot, the masses of people that got into RVing through COVID, I think the vast majority of majority of them wanted to go to the same places, right? They wanted to do the bucket list mm -hmm. trip to Yellowstone, to Yosemite, or go to that RV resort that everybody was buzzing about. So it's absolutely true that the most popular places at the most popular times are really, really hard to book. But it is completely untrue that campgrounds are full and at capacity across the country. I mean, there's plenty of places to camp right now. Um, you know, Olympic National Park's campgrounds might be full, but North Cascades National Park's uh, campgrounds might not be. So if you're willing to spread your net a little bit wider, you you can have an amazing time camping in 2023. But if you're hell bent on going to Anchor Down RV Resort in Tennessee, which is one of the most popular RV resorts in the country, you're going to wait two years to get a reservation. Um, but just one more point to add to that. You know, in the Northeast, a lot of these incredibly popular RV resorts that have been very difficult to book their prices have shot up over $200 a night. And a lot of the people that got into camping during COVID did not have sticker shock on that because they came from the world of cruises and hotel rooms. But RV owners that have been RV owners for decades had massive sticker shock. And now what we're hearing from our podcast listeners is that some of those resorts, and you know, particularly in the Northeast, are actually having a lot of empty sites right now because people are canceling and saying, I'm not paying $220 a night for this site. And then those high prices also created more pressure on the, the state parks and the national parks. Because if you can camp there for $30 a night, but an RV resort costs $200 a night, it, it sent a lot of people in that direction. And I really feel like the middle has disappeared. You know, the 60 to $70 full hookup site has disappeared a little bit. And now we have, you know, public campgrounds, which are dirt cheap, and a lot of private campgrounds whose prices have skyrocketed. And I hear a lot of RVers clamoring for build more, build more, build more, but you can't necessarily build them where, where they want them to be. You can't you can't go and just willy nilly add ten big RV resorts outside of Yosemite. I mean that it, it would take forever, and they wouldn't allow it. What? And it's a hard business proposition too, right? Because something that some people don't understand is how short the camping season is for some of those really popular tourist destinations. So yeah. in order for those campground owners to maximize, you know, the profit or the ROI, um, it, pricing can be really tricky too. What about on the uh, dynamic pricing? I know like a lot of park owners that we speak with do dynamic pricing. And when you go on to RVing sites, RVers hate that dynamic pricing, or at least they say they hate it on the blogs. Um, what, yeah, is I that mean, playing a role in this. Yeah, it, look, I really believe that you're seeing, um, like, it play out in real time um, yeah. as these campgrounds collect enough data from the dynamic pricing mm -hmm. to actually make it 
truly dynamic, right? So what happened was they were shooting up high, yeah. high, high to try to see what that maximum price point that they could make was. And you saw this last summer happen at some of the resorts. Um, and then they got a little too high and they couldn't sell all their spots. And then I saw for the first time ever, I won't, I don't know how comfortable we are with like naming certain chains or <laughs> franchises, but I, we, I saw one group offer a discount code, which I had never seen before from that group, a discount code go out last summer because I think they had gotten too high and people weren't, um, you know, you, you, you weren't biting on those prices. So we think we saw a little bit of a fluctuation in our experience coming down, even where we were at Myrtle Beach was lower actually than what we were seeing last year because they got to fill those sites. I think what they're doing is now introducing some other fees to make some money, right? Price lock fees. So I, I paid a so, site lock okay, fee at Carolina come. Pines for the first time in my life, begrudgingly. You know, I paid a $25 yeah. site lock <laughs> fee. I think dynamic pricing hurt. Or is, additional, yeah. Go ahead. I think dynamic pricing is bad for families. They're the ones that get hurt because a typical RV family is going to go on vacation Memorial Day weekend, the 4th of July. They're going to go at those most popular spots because that's when their kids are off sports. And, you know, they're the ones getting the most hammered by the dynamic pricing model. You know, if you can camp Sunday to Thursday, it's not going to hurt you that much. Or if you can camp in the shoulder seasons, it's not going to hurt you that much. So it, it saddens me a little because I feel like, you know, we when we got into RVing, it was an incredibly middle class proposition. You know, we were paying 30, 40 bucks a night for full hookup sites. And I, I, I worry that you lose people that the RV industry has won the affordability argument for a long, long time. And I worry a little bit that we might start losing that if, if the pricing doesn't change a bit. All right. Well, we have to take a break to recognize our sponsor, but we'll be back with uh, Jeremy and Stephanie here in a few minutes. WCM's Park Update is being brought to you by Woodall's Campground Magazine. For over five decades, Woodall's Campground Magazine has aimed to provide park owners and operators with the relevant industry news they need to run their businesses more efficiently. As times have changed, so has Woodall's Campground Magazine. Besides just its print publication, which is distributed to more than 14,000 industry professionals every month, the magazine also reaches readers through its various social media platforms, including Facebook at Woodall CM, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Woodall's Campground Magazine also offers a daily e-blast, which highlights the top news from the industry. The best part? Everything we do is advertiser-supported and free to our readers. As the outdoor hospitality industry continues to grow at a rapid pace, it is important to stay up to date on trends and other relevant news. Subscribe to Woodall's Campground Magazine at woodallscm.com. Hi, welcome back to WCM's Park Update, and we are chatting with Jeremy and Stephanie Puglisi, and I think I've done just fine with their last name so far. It's so, a win. Uh, we're doing pretty good. Um, and we were chatting a little bit about dynamic pricing and the price increases in the camping market uh, before the break. I will say that I have never camped at a private campground, and uh, I've only camped at state campgrounds. I'm a tent camper. We're looking to get an RV, but um, I like uh, our local state campground. It offers like $12 a night for a tent site, which is pretty cheap. Um, and I will say I do, I am a little bit concerned like you are, Jeremy, that the, the prices are getting a little high, but at the same time, um, a lot of the park owners I speak with are saying that they're getting bookings like crazy still. So um, I think maybe some of their midweek sites have kind of thinned out, but I know on the weekends, everybody seems to be booked. So um, I, d I don't know where the pricing is going to go from here. So well, I said before the middles disappeared. I actually think that, that yeah. Mike's former org organization has done a really good job of, of, you know, KOA's pricing, as far as I have seen in the last two to three years, has not gone insane in terms of going up. I mean, I think there's still a lot of full hookup sites at KOA's for 60, 70, 80 bucks. You guys had on the people from Spacious Skies campgrounds recently, and I think they're also doing a great job of identifying a middle ground for pricing. They're not, from what I've seen of their 15 campgrounds, they're not charging $150 a night either. So I think there's opportunities for people to to be in the middle price-wise 
and they don't have to have massive water slides and multi-million dollar facilities. They can just offer a good old fashioned camping experience, which I, I think, you know, KOA has nailed for 50 years. You know, maybe Spacious Skies well, is that, nailing now, too. <clears throat> that was part of the uh, the science behind subdividing those brands several years ago was, was to create that journey holiday resort feel. And uh, kind of it, it was driven by the fact that that campers uh, wanted to know what they what to expect when they got there, what amenities were going to be there. So that was very easy to line those up and say, well, if, in order to be a holiday, you have to have this. In order to be a resort, you have to have this. And then the, we didn't dictate pricing at the time, but it, pricing sort of follows that because they start tagging. Well, if I've, I've got a, a, a water a pool and a spray park, I'm going to charge a little bit more for the spray park. And and they kind of found their level. And I, I think that's that's helped control that, at least in KOA's, in KOA's situation. I think, I think that's true. I just think it's still a little volatile right now in the resort space. So I think that people, you know, campground owners have to understand the that if you're going to charge a resort price, you need to offer resort amenities, uh, truly resort amenities, especially now with an influx of people who may be more traditional hotel stay or, or Airbnb people. We were talking about this a lot back on our on our trip that, you know, we had friends that were in a cabin and, um, you know, the level, you know, they they use the laundry room and we're told, you know, the laundry room's run by an outside. Oh, sorry, you lost your money. It's run by an outside, you know, operator. And I was like, you don't, they You're don't not say that at told Disney that World. At a hotel, <laughs> you know, at Disney, it's not like, oh, sorry, not our, not our job, not our responsibility. Um, so, you know, if you're going to try to capture that three hundred dollar a night, you know, cabin a person at a resort, you're going to have to also provide that resort experience. So, it's a question: Do you want to be in that market or not? That's the so weird we thing about COVID. About, about, uh... Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeremy. That's the crazy thing about COVID, too, is that prices spiked and all, a lot of these places were understaffed. So they were actually not offering the best possible service, but the prices skyrocketed. So, you know, what what becomes normal is very interesting to think about. Like, where where is it all going to settle? It has it certainly hasn't settled yet. So we talked a lot about uh, new, new campers in the market. But what about all these new owners? We've got a lot of new money coming in, a lot of inexperienced uh uh, investor type money coming in and buying up these campgrounds. Is that uh, help fuel the fire? Because these people want their, want their investment to pay. Yeah. I mean, the, the money matters now, right? I think in a way that it, it, this is like, we're, we're seeing like practically like a VC kind of a mentality in some of these campgrounds that are being really like snapped up and gobbled up. Um, we started seeing this with the real estate development groups coming in, especially, I mean, in the Northeast, we see this like on steroids, right? Um, so it's, um, we, we have as many questions as you have right now, your traditional camper or your camper that's been in the biz for the last 10 years is a little bit unhappy with their campground experience in general. Probably not the ones that like Ben are still going only to state parks. The most, the thing that they're unhappy with is their reservation experience, right? They go and they try to book the site that they've been going to for years and they're unhappy because they can't get it. But there's this feeling at private campgrounds, especially the nicer ones. It's a little hard to translate. People feel like the value isn't there right now that they used to get right out of that nicer private campground experience. The only thing that I think I can compare it to is the feeling I get when I'm traveling for work and staying at a hotel and I'm paying the same price, but I don't get my house service and, you know, my housekeeping service anymore. These little things have gone, you know, by the wayside and don't feel like they're coming back. So um, I wonder if a place we were, like we said, we we're at Carolina Pines, a larger group that owns that. Um, we wonder if they can sustain the level of growth without it hurting their bottom line because there was a lot of empty sites. And to be honest, we feel like the value proposition wasn't as high as it was in years past. We've stayed there twice before. And what Carolina about, Pines, we thought so Carolina perfect. Pines was reasonably priced compared to a lot of other resorts in the area. Mm hmm. Yeah. What about the argument from like park owners? You know, I go to a lot of park owner shows. Um, you know, they're, they feel like they have to invest a lot of money into their parks to keep up, especially with some of the new developments, the investment groups, and what the demands are for families. So a lot of them are investing in new amenities, new cabins, they're adding glamping options, they're adding those water features. And, you know, they're looking at 
a whole list of things that they want to do and it all costs money. And so I think maybe that's where some of the cost increases are coming to. Um, they're trying to stay in business, I guess. And I, if I was a campground owner, I, I'd want, I would want people to come back to my campground for the next 20 years. I wouldn't want them to come once yeah. and say this was an overpriced experience. And I, I want to be clear here. Stephanie and I love RV resort camping. You know, we've been to yeah. all of these places. We love these places. And actually, for years, we defended the pricing of a lot of these places when people, our listeners, would complain. You know, when people would say, how on earth could you pay 160 for Fort Wilderness? And, and we would say... It's amazing. You know, it's it's a unique experience. You know, we've defended the pricing model for years. It's just yeah. this spike into, I mean, $280 a night. I'm, I'm not complaining about $120 a night. Yeah. I'm not even necessarily complaining about $150 a night. But when, you know, prices spike over $200 a night for an RV site where you are hauling your accommodation to, a, yeah. to empty space that has nothing but hookups and maybe a gravel pad. Uh, I, I think it's just really worth having this conversation about the, you know, about the pricing. So I'm, I'm really just talking about this highest end that, that things jumped up to. Do you think that's ever going to really change though? When, when you've, you've got folks like you who may be willing to turn around at the front desk and say, I can't afford to stay here. And there's 10 people standing behind you with their wallets. Out. I'm not sure those 10 people I'm are standing sure behind right there now. Are. Yeah. That's, I, that's the <laughs> that's thing that's right what we're now. Questioning. Yeah. So places that you couldn't get into, um, a, a year ago that really spiked at that over 200 price point, we're seeing empty spots there right now. Yeah. Um, so that's our question, right? And if some of our public campgrounds start to really up the ante a little bit, South Carolina, you can use this as an example for everything, right? Huntington Beach State Park, they just reinvested in their sites and rebuilding that campground. And yes, the prices went up, but they went up to that mid-level, right, where I think we're talking maybe $50, $60 mm -hmm. a night. So a family like ours might say next year, hey, let's go to Huntington Beach State Park and get that. What do, what, what do we have? Water and electric now maybe there mm -hmm. instead of the resort. And we're right there on the beach, right? Well, that's, it's, Stephanie's, it's that bringing, Stephanie's bringing up a huge question of where this all goes next. South Carolina almost doubled their prices for RV sites. So I'm really wondering, are, are other states going to going to do the same? Because they're seeing, oh, my God, the private campground up the road is charging 150. And we have we have hookups here. You know, there's a lot of some state parks have electric or water and electric. And then that really that awesome $20 a night, $30 a night, which, of course, is subsidized by tax dollars. Um, you know, are those going to disappear, too, as the state parks, you know, jump up with their with their pricing? What do you think of um, that, you know, looking at the public side? Um, I know there's a couple states that have introduced bills. I think maybe one of them has passed where they're going to let the, I think Florida is one of them, where they're going to let uh, their residents have the first shot at the reserving campsites to kind of quell some of the issues around what you mentioned earlier, Stephanie, where, you know, people are just booking these sites way in advance and people don't have a lot of options. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I guess. Yeah, I understand it. I think, you know, people feel that they pay, they live in this place, they pay state taxes, maybe, right? Yeah. Depends on what state you're talking about. <laughs> and they have this amenity that they're supporting with their tax dollars and they can't even get a site. Florida is a great yeah. example of that. People that live in Florida feel like they're pushed out and they don't really know what's happening, right? Because people are reselling. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on that people can't really get their finger on. And that's not okay, right? Like, I do like the idea of doing a residence first, but the problem is, is they're going to have to have this process so buttoned up so that it doesn't get exploited, right? Like the last thing you want is to start this micro resell economy with people <laughs> in the Florida state. And I'm honest, I see that coming. Like, you know, just being like honest about how people are and what happens if they don't have the, um, you know, that's just a, their process is down, which obviously we see sometimes government, especially with the campgrounds, has a hard time with their process is <laughs> in running things. So we'll see. Um, I like it for a for a try. I really do. I know a lot of people be unhappy. It also other people might complain because they say it'll take tax uh, tourism dollars out of their local economy. That's we, a that's a risk. We have had hackers private message us yeah. and offer to get us state park and national park campsites. We said no. But that there is that actually exists. I mean, there are yeah. people that hack into 
these these state parks to get the, these elite sites. I like the lottery systems that I think the MPS is messing around with, where you just put in, oh, I want to go to this campground at Yosemite, and then they they I, I think they're testing that there, um, and then it's just yeah. lottery based, and they pull names out of a hat, based a virtual hat, and you either get the site or you don't. So you guys, have you guys had any opportunity to try out the automated unmanned campground, those overnight along the highway uh, stops yet that are starting to pop up around the, around the middle of the country? Like the loves um, is running some of those. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we haven't personally, but I've heard people, um, I've actually heard some really positive um, responses to that from people that have used it. So, um, it's really limited right now, it seems, but the nice thing is, is it's, um, taking off some pressure from these overnight RV parking spots, right? Like that are getting over, talk about overcrowding, um, businesses like Cabela's and Cracker Barrel and that used to just like, 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 oh yeah, sure. Park in our back lot. Now it's like competitive to get into the back lot of Cracker Barrel. So, so I love the fact that the market's responding to that and saying, look, we see that some people want to just be able to pull off quick stop for the night, right? Not set up camp and that there could be a more, a less, um, <laughs> dramatic option than like trying to figure out if you're allowed in a parking lot at random businesses in a, in a community. So were you guys ever boondockers? Yeah. Well, remember we're from the Northeast, so there is not a ton of public land for boondocking here. So we're, you know, we're definitely dry campers who do do a lot of state parks without hookups, but boondocking in the Northeast is, is not quite a thing. I've had people email me and say, Hey, I want to do a boondocking trip up the East coast to Maine. And I was like, good luck. You know, there's, there's not <laughs> like, BLM, no. there's not BLM yeah. land here. There's harvest yeah. hosts, Hard yeah. you know, yeah. like things like that. So like that kind of a, a, a solution in our area is much better. Um, and we've stayed at a lot of harvest host locations. Um, and also of course we've done our share of Walmart parking lots and that's where that KOA journey comes in. Like for me, I'm like, Oh, can I stay overnight in a Walmart parking lot or just find the local KOA journey for 40 bucks a night. And eventually over the years we picked the KOA journey every time, right? Just that easy in easy out. Um, but that's an example of just like the market finds its people, right? And like the one, like, is it, is it worth 40 bucks for me? Yes. Cause I don't hear the, you know, 18 wheel or idling next to us at night. I think, um, another question real quick before we wrap this up, I guess, um, back to the overcrowding thing. Do you think the, uh, industry ever gets overdeveloped? That's been a question I've been thinking about for a while. Like we have all these new mm -hmm. campgrounds, RV park developments, you think there, we ever reach a point where we're like, oh, we built too many. So we're far away from that, that with all those RVs sold. Yeah. But I do think that we'll lose the value proposition. Okay. So I think that campgrounds will get overdeveloped in terms of their amenities. And so they have to charge a price that's so high in yeah. order to make their money. And people go, hmm, I'm not sure about this. I could do an all-inclusive in the Caribbean. So I, I do think that that is something that the industry maybe has their head in the sand a little bit because it's been good years with the COVID crowds. So, so we've got a lot of uh, owners and managers that watch, that watch this show. What's the one thing you'd like to tell an owner manager out there that they should take away from this discussion? Customer service is everything. The campground experience matters. When we started camping, the fact that somebody would help us if we needed it, the fact that there was a friendly face there checking us in and bringing us to our site and just the neighborhoodliness of it was something that helped introduce us to a way of life that we didn't know. And um, that's that's struggling. And I understand why it's struggling these days. I understand how hard it is to staff these campgrounds, but, um, a friendly face matters. Customer service matters. Helping your people matters. A clean place matters. Like the, it's the basics. I know. I think everybody's getting caught up in the, in the bells and whistles. The basics matter. And it's a way to, you know, I know that private campgrounds do in some ways consider the public campgrounds as, as competition. That's a complicated question, but those are all ways for private campgrounds to win. You know, for new new RV owners, it, it is really nice when there's an owner on site, you know, or there's a manager on site, or 
you know, it's not required that they come help you with your RV, but my God, that means the world to a new RV owner. If, some, if they're having some little issue getting their furnace going and there's a knowledgeable campground owner on site or, or whatever it may yeah. be that, that helps them, you're going to win. You're going to win a customer for life when you do that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeremy and Stephanie for coming on the show. Um, uh, how can people learn more about you? I guess, where can they go to buy your books or watch your podcast? You want you you want to do the spiel? Okay, I will. Okay, we have the RV Atlas podcast is in anywhere you get your podcast, Spotify, iTunes, wherever. Um, and then our books are everywhere. The books are sold. We love private, independent bookstores, but we're also on Amazon, of course, and BarnesandNoble.com, etc. Um, and then on the socials, we're the RV Atlas also. When does your new book come out? I know you're working on one. Well, so the Where Should We Camp out? Next National Parks just came out. Now, so it's in bookstores across the country, and now we're working on a, a, another one. We have not disclosed the title yet. My final thought, too, to everybody listening, it, we, we poked the bear a little bit on some of the pricing issues. I do want to say I, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be an RV owner or a camper than right now. We have more options than we've ever had, and I still incredibly think this is the, the best lifestyle for families and the, the best value for families. I'll forward all the emails I get to you, Jeremy. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you jeremy and stephanie for coming on and uh thanks everyone for watching thanks guys thank you thank you thank you for listening to wcm's park update a production of woodall's campground magazine join us for a new show each tuesday at 3 p.m eastern on facebook youtube and wherever you listen to podcasts Follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn for daily news and updates and subscribe to our news feed on our website at woodallscm.com. Show hosts are Ben Quiggle and Mike Gast. Executive producers Rick Kessler and Alex Burkett. Copyright 2022, G&G Media Group.